you like, uh-huh. oh yeah. And usually I call them out on it, but in a joking way. You know, the club's really gracious. Are we ready? All right, I'm super excited. We are ready, hey Gary Urbanski. Um, we are doing this. We've got Darius in the house, Eric in the house behind the scenes uh, with four misfits trying to get me up and ready. And of course, the guest of honor today is Joel Jr. Morales. What's up, my friend? Wepa, wepa. Wepa, wepa. I'm very excited because um, I think we have it down, Pat, and Joel has been patient. We're really trying to get the camera out of here so that I can just look at this camera and enjoy my conversation. We don't have this giant thing sitting in front of us. So thank you for being patient and welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited. So Joel is a community advocate. Uh, he is with the Center, the LGBTQ Plus Center, the place, I believe, where you go and you get all of your information in town, and it's not just for LGBTQ. There's so much information and so much good things that come out of this center that educate us all. So uh, I'm excited to hear your story, though. I, I want to hear more about you. I heard about your middle name, so I like this story. So they love origin stories. Yes. So tell them a little bit about you. Yeah, so once again, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Joel G. Morales. My preferred pronouns are he, him, his. And I was actually born in Western Massachusetts in 1982. And I was grew up in Massachusetts, let me tell you, very poor. I'm still poor now. <laughs> but I'm a proud, queer, Latinx individual. Um, I was born in Massachusetts, like I said. And then my family transitioned over to back to the island um, when I was in sixth grade. So that was kind of like a culture shock. It was know? Western Mass Yeah, back to Puerto Rico. It was totally different, right? Because I'm used to schools being inside and like you have classrooms and hallways where on the island it's the opposite, right? The classrooms are outside, there's no hallways or lockers and that was kind of like a culture shock. I remember when I first moved down to Puerto Rico in sixth grade, right? Like in the middle of my uh, adolescence and just thinking like, I didn't want to be here, mom. Why you brought me here? And it was my stepdad. <laughs> But, you know, honestly, uh, I, I believe, because we have moved so much in my life, um, even throughout, like, before moving to Puerto Rico, my family tends to travel a lot. I went to, not county college, but just from, like, elementary all the way to high school, I went to 12 different schools. Were your parents military? My parents, they acted military, but they wasn't. <laughs> no, they just, they just travel a lot. And... <clears throat> You know, I was raised, like I said earlier, like very poor, so subsidized housing, and um, like I said, I'm Puerto Rican. And but we decided to move to the island because um, my my grandparents were getting older, and that's where they wanted to be. They wanted to be back on the island. My mom was a caregiver to them, and so we decided to move back to Puerto Rico. Once again, it was a culture shock from Sao Lorenzo, um, Puerto Rico. Shout out to Puerto Rico because um, right now, currently, there are oh a lot gosh. of things happening on the island. I just went to Puerto Rico um, in November. They were still recovering from Hurricane Maria. And now with all these recent the earthquakes, uh, earthquakes 500, over 500 earthquakes that have been on the island. So it's a lot of devastation. A lot of people lost their power. So a lot of support is needed on the island. My brother was actually out here for the holidays. And um, he was just telling me, like, that he's devastated, right? Because this is something that you know, impacts everyone. And like I said earlier, they're still suffering from Hurricane Maria and all these added things. And what people don't realize is that Puerto Ricans were also American citizens, right? We're also citizens. It's not amazing that people don't get that. They don't. They're like, oh, you have your papers? I'm like, I am uh, <laughs> your passport, right? <laughs> like all that. But going back to the story, when I went, when I was raised on the island, it was it was a, a total culture shock for me. Uh, especially super young because dating back before I even moved to the island as a queer um, as a queer man, um, I was discovering things about myself early on, and um, in my queerness and my identity and my gender and all that. And 
um, growing up also Pentecostal and, and a very religious family, very conservative family. Well, the Latin, yeah, the Latin community too. Um, it's not always, it's not as easily acceptable. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you something. I, I've always wanted to ask somebody this. Um, growing up, the word queer mm -hmm. was such a derogatory term. But you use it freely, and I hear it a lot more. Yeah. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that? Because I'm fascinated by how, it, I feel like it's because you just took the ownership back. But tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I know a lot of um, older generations, there's a lot of stigma. I'm one of those. Stigma with the word queer. But queer is what we use now as an umbrella term for the LGBTQ plus IA community. So it's just kind of like the umbrella to that. And queerness is something that it was used as a derogatory term. So it's a term that we actually took back and took the power of that word. That way it doesn't impact and affect us in the way it did historically. Um, also, but also recognizing that there's is historical context behind the word right. queer, right? And also recognizing that. So the word maybe not be for everyone, um, but it's something I embrace wholeheartedly because it just kind of puts the umbrella to it. Because I still have a difficult, obviously I have a difficult time saying mm -hmm. it, uh, but I am of the older, way older generation. Uh, but I love to hear you embrace it. I love to hear you take it. I think that taking the ownership back of it and control of it is just so powerful. Yeah. Uh, so what was that like growing up and, and in that Pentecostal, conservative uh, island and you are trying to discover yourself? Did you have a supportive family? Yeah. So full disclosure, oh, my mom is super, super supportive now. I love my mom to death. Um, but once again, when you're raised in this very machismo culture, um, even in religion, they're telling you that being gay is a sin from early on, and that's just embedded in the culture. And not also, not only that, but myself trying to discover who I am, because when we, when we think about people of color and queer people of color, a lot of times they're not in media. They're not right. awareness to it. Um, I thought I was just different. Why am I having these feelings? And I, I knew like early on, it seemed like an elementary, but I had no support as far as to say, or I had the words to it. And no point of reference really either, right? Yeah. Because if you're, if you're there, that's not really talked about. It wasn't anything that was, um, you weren't seeing it out there, so you didn't know what to do with the feelings that you were having. Exactly, and I remember one of the early on um, connections that had to do with being LGBT was like AIDS, right? Because with the 80s, yeah. when the HIV AIDS epidemic happened, it was associated as a gay man's disease. And right. we, know now, we know now that HIV AIDS impacts everyone. So well, that was also like a stigma that kind of like that's the only thing I knew that associated with it. And I remember when it was, when I, I want to think back a little bit, once I finally found those words, right? And I found out my queerness and I found out who I am and I'm on the island. At this point I was, I want to say I was 18 years old. I was in high school. And once I finally had the words, I actually sat with my mom and I was like, mom, um, what would you do if one of us were gay? And she was like, I'll disown them and throw them down a river. Yeah. And I was just in total shock because no long, no, I didn't feel safe in my own mind, right? At that time, I no longer felt safe in my own home. And at that time, I decided to leave the island and um, leave my family behind and find solidarity somewhere else. Where'd you go? So I went back to Western Massachusetts where I originally was from and actually moved in with a friend of mine who we stayed connected with throughout all those years, even when I was on the island. And <clears throat> I went through like past traumas in my life too, that um, just trauma cues, if you're triggered by sexual assault or anything like that, but um, I was early on, I experienced trauma early on in my life. I was sexually assaulted as a child and then again as a adult. And so discovering all that and those things, those parts of me were actually blacked out. Like I totally forgot about it. And one of the things also as being raised is like 
you go through life and something happens to you, you brush it under the rug. Sure. You don't process it, you keep it moving. Why are you still worried about something that happened last week? But we want we know with trauma or any type of um, incident, it could be big or small trauma, right? It could be years. I'm gonna rear its ugly head at some point. Exactly. And the more you bury it, the really the more honestly it's like a volcano. It's crazy. And it manifests in other different ways Correct. when you don't process that stuff. And so it's so important. So mental health, I'm a big advocate for mental health because it's so important. But sometimes our children or our youth don't get that don't have those access because sometimes the abuse could be happening in the own home. Right? right. But I'm going through those traumas and those struggles and then once I finally was ready to come out, I was exposed with that news. So it just kind of sheltered me a little bit. Um, and I left the island at 18 and I ended up moving uh, with a friend and this same friend then sexually assaulted me. Oh, gosh. So then I became homeless. So I was homeless at the age of 18 for a few months, um, just trying to find, like, trying to survive, really, in Massachusetts. And it was a really struggle. I remember I used to go to, like, a friend's house and try to shower and just try to find community. And I remember the first exposure I had to the LGBTQ community was people that were more at risk for like substance abuse and all these other things. And I thought that's what the world was for us um, because I didn't see any role models at that time. So it was, um, it was a journey there. And you know, I was homeless for a few months. And thank God, because like I said right here, you know, as a person who grew up uh, under like with housing and different things like that, I was able to access um, Section 8 at the age of 18, so it, it actually helped me be housed for a period of time until I figured things out. What's going on at home, like in, in, on the island? Are you still communicating with mom? Do, do they have any idea at that time that you come out to them? No, I did. I decided not to come out. I decided just to separate from my family for a period of time and just kind of like figure it out on my own. My mom now tells me we process that actually together. We went to therapy together to process oh, that time awesome. and that difficult time because she didn't realize. And actually, she, she shares now. She's like, I wish all my kids were gay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those things like it's, it's not normalized, right? Correct. And I remember when she when she finally did find out, she just uh, associated with like HIV and AIDS. I just don't want you to die. And I'm like, mom, Correct. like I'm not, you know, like. Um, advocate for these different things and she just thought like all these different thoughts was a, what was embedded in her so just having those conversations and finding the words too because a lot of times there's a lot of words that we have in English that doesn't really translate well into Spanish so sometimes finding those those middle grounds is so important. I, I find that there's a lot that you know because it's Zebra Coalition and so many the organizations that LGBTQ youth uh, homelessness is actually a big challenge. Uh, talk about that a little bit because I think people don't realize that that kind of you've got to get out scenario still happens. Uh, you would think it's more normalized because of TV and movies and, and we talk about it all the time. I mean, we have everything's been legalized uh, as it should be or at least there's, we're working on it. Florida is always an interesting challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like people don't realize that the youth are especially challenged with the homeless. Yeah, it's a huge challenge, honestly, because homeless, homelessness is already, there's a crisis when it comes to homelessness, right? It's such a Florida, just in general. When we talk about LGBTQ youth, uh, they experience homelessness at a higher risk or a higher level than maybe non-LGBTQ people because of the um, of their gender identity or how they define or their orientation because maybe the family uh, is not supportive. So we do see a lot of people, and that's why it's great to have organizations like Zebra Coalition specifically working towards that ending the homelessness crisis that are for LGBTQ people because we see it all the time at the center. Uh, as a director of operations for the LGBT Center, we see um, those individuals that are not housed, that are looking for shelter, but once again, there's already a homeless crisis and there's not a lot of affordable housing and more resources need to be put in, back into the community to give beds, to give these resources. Because right now, honestly, there's not that many beds and many resources. Well, and you, you think, because most people will just clump all of homelessness into one big giant pile. Mm -hmm. And uh, LGBTQ, they, that is a different because of uh, identity and and where you're, where you're at, your gender, like it, it is a challenge for the already over 
uh, the, the overpopulated shelters that are in town. And so they don't know how to address the issues. And it's not necessarily the people who are taking them in. They just don't have the beds for the uh, people who aren't LGBTQ, let alone trying to figure out how to make it so that it's comfortable and a, a place, a safe place for them. Exactly. Uh, so talk about your journey to the center. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know about the center, and I do want to talk about that because our group, I feel like there's a community of us that know, and obviously the LGBTQ community knows, and on the ally side, the advocate side, I know, but I think a lot of people don't know what the center even does. Yes. So, but how did you get there? How did I get there? Well, I, honestly, when I, I was still in Massachusetts, uh, I went down to Orlando in 2000, the end of 2011. And um, the reason why I moved to Florida specifically is because I knew there was a big Latinx community, I knew there was a big queer community, um, and I let go a lot of stuff because I used to run an outpatient detention facility in Massachusetts. So I let everything behind because I wanted to be closer to the community because I felt like I wasn't really living my ethnic self. Once I moved to Florida and Orlando, I learned early on that, you know, there was a community, but people, you know, like any type of stuff, right? People weren't plagues or right. like they, they're, you know, it's, they're in silos and stuff like that. So it was really hard to find Crazy. community outside of like a nightclub, per se, right? <laughs> um, so <clears throat> in one of my experiences, I didn't share this earlier, um, which will bring me back into the center was um, I have a rare autoimmune disease. I was diagnosed in my late 20s. I'm 38 right now, so I've been battling with 37. I don't know why I'm aging myself. 37. But for the last, the show, right? For the last 10 years, I've been battling with autoimmune disease. And uh, when I moved from Massachusetts with great health care, and I moved down to Florida, where the health care, let's be real, is not that very, not that accessible. Um, it's a very big challenge, even with my current rare autoimmune disease, which is the Pichette syndrome, which attacks anyone with a blood vessel. Um, so that's my whole body. Um, and when I started, uh, when I worked down here, when I moved down here, I started working at um, Lake Segment of Health, which is now Aspire. And um, so I was trying to get health insurance and stuff like that, but because I wasn't on medication, I wasn't on treatment for my rare autoimmune, I actually ended up in the hospital for about a year um, in all of um, 2012 because I had a appendicitis that was ruptured and because I had a rare autoimmune disease, they didn't know what to do with me. A year? A year, yeah, because the first four months I was, well, a year to recover, but four months in the hospital um, because I ended up getting appendicitis and ended up rupturing fistula form, just a lot of complication, a lot of stuff that really, really uh, put me down for about a year. I was even in a nursing home. That I mean, uh, and, uh, wow. yeah, because I was being fed the needles or, uh, so it was just a really had to figure out how to address what was going on and your mother. All that, so it was, it was a struggle that first year. And then after that, I'm being in the hospital and just kind of like thinking away, like what do I want to do? How, how do I want to get connected? And for some reason, because I learned about the center when I first moved here, and I was like, you know what, when I get out of here, um, I know it's gonna be a, a, a little bit of a journey for me to get back into work, but I still want to volunteer. I was thinking about all these things, and I've always been an advocate, and I know they were doing a lot of great work. So I started volunteering at the center after I was able to heal and recover in 2013. And I became a volunteer, and then I started working for the center as their HIV program manager uh, for a little bit and doing counseling. And by that time, I was working also multiple jobs. So really, I got connected because I wanted to be community. And I felt like the center was a great place, and I met so many beautiful people. I felt affirmed in my identity. I didn't have to be someone else, right? It's so important, right? It's so important. There's a, there's a safe. I feel like a lot of times I have a lot of LGBT uh, come on and they talk about safety. Like, you want to be in an environment where it's safe to be who you are. Mm -hmm. And though most of us take that for granted, yeah. and you don't always have that. No. Uh, and so, what a cool thing to be able to feel that way at the center. Yeah, for many years, even before my past my past careers, I was working more in manufacturing and continuous improvement coordinating. And I remember 2004 when um, marriage equality passed in Massachusetts. Right, we were very um, ahead of the time. Yeah, and I remember my manager um, 
you know, bless his heart, whatever happens, but I remember him coming in, and I wasn't living my ethnic self, my ethnic self, right? I was portraying someone who I wasn't, and he came in my office, it was like, can you believe these effing, just imagine what it was, right? And then I really internalized that, and it really brought me back to my childhood. So to have a, a place now, where in Florida, where I could just be myself without no judgment, I, I, I really feel like I'm living my authentic self. And once I started working at the center, I just felt very connected and very involved, and it, it was a lot of resources. Actually, right now, um, the LGBT Center is the largest HIV testing site in Central Florida. So talk about the services. So HIV testing yeah. center. We, we, yep, we do HIV testing seven days a week. We're open seven days a week. Do you have to be LGBT? No, it's for everyone. Our whole mission is to empower the LGBTQ plus and their allies through information, advocacy, and support. So we're there for everyone because what we believe is if you reach the most marginalized individual, then everyone gets uplifted, right? Um, so it's just building that safe space for everyone. The center has grown tremendously, especially in the last year or so. We've been adding new programming. Um, so we do have HIV testing, hepatitis C testing. We also have STI testing, free mental health counseling. We provide vaccinations for Hep A, B. We even do pregnancy tests. Uh, we have about like 35 different groups that meet at the center. And in those groups, we probably see a thousand people coming through our doors every single month. They could be gender identity um, um, groups or even substance abuse groups or codependency cool or gender identity, like a new group. Not new group, but this one group that I'm really fond of is called our Gender Identity Caregiver Group. Um, because we do have an organization called OYA oh yeah, that works with trans and non-binary youth from the age of 13 to 24, and they meet there every Tuesday. But we, what we're learning is that um, youth are coming out younger and younger as trans and non-binary. So we open this group, um, and basically it's a two-part group, and it's facilitated by a mental health provider uh, who specializes in gender identity issues and works with the parents and the caregivers. And they need to build support with each other, right, and normalize it. And then the, the youth is facilitated by a trans woman who was actually our transgender um, service coordinator. Shout out to Michelle. Um, and it just builds support, right? And because there were kids that were trying to get into the group, and obviously conversation between 13 and 24 years old, a lot of the there's some almost like nine or 10. So for me, cognizant of that, and I have to ask you something because I have had somebody ask this question I did not know how to answer. I since have learned. Non-binary, that's a, a word you're hearing, we're hearing a lot. Yeah. Main, it's becoming more mainstream. Yeah. What is non-binary? Non-binary because gender is on, like, for years it's been on, like, either you're female or male. And non-binary really means that the person may identify as both, may identify as neither, they're just that. So when someone refers to themselves as non-binary, their preferred pronouns typically will be, like, they, that. Yeah. See, good to know, because I really believe that a lot of times people walk around, even on the ally side, that are sort of embracing and enmeshed in it, and they don't know some of the terms. And you read it, and you don't want to ask. So I'm always going to ask the questions that um, I think most people want to know, because I had to, I had to look it up myself, even though I had heard it a whole bunch. Yeah. So what's coming up for the center? Oh, we have a lot of stuff coming up. Talk about it. Right, but besides our um, besides our regular programming, and if you want to learn more about that, you can always visit our website at thecenterorlando.org or follow us on Instagram and Facebook, which is the Center Orlando on both media platforms. But um, another a big thing that's happening is that we're having a book signing with um, Clyde Jones on January 29th of this month. So if you want to learn more information about that, um, look out for the Clyde Jones. Clyde Jones is a Clyde Jones. Yeah. Uh, I'll, LGBTQ advocate, he's been um, in front of the work for like AIDS awareness back with the AIDS epidemic. Um, search him, research him, he's actually um, coming out with his book, so he's doing a whole book signing. So he's going to be there um, that day. And another huge thing that's happening April 1st, which is not how April Fool's Joe. We're doing a new turn of an ancestor. It's a center staff versus a voice staff. On April 1st, it's called Turn of Bob. And basically, Turn of Bob is historically what people don't do drag, I do drag. So you're going to see myself, our executive director, George Wallace, some of our staff. 
dressing up as drag, entertaining the crowd, fighting for some tips, and the tickets are online right now. So it's a fundraiser that we have had here. It's at that boy. It's going to be at the boy. So shout out to Brandon as well. Yeah, I have a turnaround. I dressed up a whole bunch last year. Dark Star last year helped me. Um, I did a charity party for our and um, Dark Star gave me the team to turn dress. I had the heels, and then, then Dark Star from from Harlem yeah. sent me a, a amazing, amazing uh, hair and hair and makeup person. person. And, and I, I want to tell you that if you have ever gotten, gotten into, into that, that, it is a lot, lot of work. work. And, and it, so, so I have such a great respect for drag drag community. But oh, wow, wow, the, the amount, amount of work, work and effort for energy, energy and passion to go, go into what they, they do artistically all the time is crazy. crazy. So, so as part of that, that being said, it's your local drag track from first. It is a lot of work and it's a lot of resources and money that they take for it. Just to make a big shout out to drag track, they make a tutorial in the advanced center last week, but Jazz has been shout out to Jazz has been. Oh, and they took me out of the city. I was in a chair that, and I'm going to tag him later, later because I, I draw drawn my blank on the wall. He brought his own chair and everything. In two hours, I was in hair and makeup in my house. Uh, because that's, so imagine if you're doing that all the time as a performer, that is, that's what you do. That is, that's your life and your lifestyle. It's really cool, uh, the amount of work that goes into that. All right, so we're going to share, again, all of Joelle's contact information, how you can learn more about the center. We'll give the links to the events, the turnabout, the Clive Jones uh, signing on the 29th, um, how you can reach out to him if you have any questions. I'd love to have advocates on here because sometimes people don't want to go to the facility. They want to reach out to somebody who has uh, been transparent and authentic like you have, and they want to reach out to you first. I think I want to encourage you to reach out because Joel is just as wonderful and amazing uh, with you if you have need anything that he is in person here. So um, give us give a shout out with on mentorship and gratitude. Can you give a shout out to somebody or some people that have made an impact on your life? Yeah, so there's a lot of people that impacted my life in many different ways. Um, one of them is my mom because the journey and the healing process that we have been through together and um, just rediscovering ourselves has been such an amazing journey because both and I, um, both her and I suffered through or went through domestic violence because that's what I thought love was. So we're able to connect in that way now and realize that we're, we're here together. So my mom is one of those mentorships and I have a lot of local mentors, the mentors here, like George Wallace at the, uh, at the center, the executive director is an amazing mentor. I love working with George. Uh, Mark Miroga, who is a uh, program director for Blue Eagle Fund, which is a board actually sit on. It's a foundation where we give out money to local organizations. We actually put out almost $2 million to over 30 nonprofits. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. So I can shout out so many other people, but those are the ones that just come to mind right now. Well, you're a blessing to have on. Thank you, my friend. So Thank much. You. Center does so much great work. Director of Operations, Joel Jr. Morales. So give him a shout out, give me a shout out. If you want to reach out to me first, that's fine too, but reach out. Don't go through it all by yourself. If you have questions, don't be afraid to ask. Um, we love you guys. Have an amazing day. I'll see you soon. All right.